Amen. Amen. All right, look here <clears throat> in your Bibles at Jeremiah chapter number 12, verse number 1 with me. Jeremiah chapter number 12, verse number 1. We're going to begin in the beginning of the chapter here. The Bible says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherous that deal very treacherously? Now this morning I'm going to be preaching about an age-old question. Something that comes up, you know, it pops into a Christian's mind, it pops into unbelievers' mind, you know, it pops into, you know, uh, just about every person's mind that ever even, you know, contemplates the idea of just there being a creator and a just God. And right here we see even Jeremiah asking the question. Look here at verse number one. I want you to notice very, very carefully the words that Jeremiah uses and what he is implying. Look at what it says in verse number one. He starts off and he says, Righteous art thou, O Lord. So he starts off in the beginning by declaring, God, I know that you are righteous. I know that you are a just God, right? But then he says this, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with me, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgment. So I, he's saying, I know that you're righteous, but just let me ask you something that doesn't make sense to me about your judgments. That's what he's saying. That's why he says, yet. So even though I know that you're righteous, that's the point, yet let me ask you something about your judgment. So righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Then he says this, Wherefore, that means why, wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? So he, he's asking the question, the way of the wicked, you know, the life that they live. You know, the, the, the route that they go down in their life, right? Oftentimes our lives are, are, are likened unto a way as you're traveling through your life. You go to different places, different times, right? You experience different things. So he says, wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? So he's, he starts off saying, I know that you're just. I know that you're righteous, but it seems like something just doesn't fit with that. It seems like something just doesn't make sense. I know you're righteous and I know you're just, but why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do wicked people do well? Why do wicked people seem like they're blessed in their lives and they're thriving and they're successful and they're prospering? He says after that, wherefore, why? He asks another question along the same lines. Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? So then he, he follows it up with another question, you know, reforming the same question, just kind of at a different angle, a different way. He says, wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? He's saying, why are all these wicked people, these people that deal treacherously, that do violence, that do wicked things, why are all these people so happy? Now, we're not reading... <clears throat> about, you know, some brand new Christian, some baby Christian, are we? We're reading about the prophet Jeremiah. And he is the man that has had the Holy Spirit. He's been filled with the Holy Spirit and preaching God's Word. There comes a time where he stops and he looks around at life and he looks around at his Christian life and, and the wicked people coming in, the wicked people going, and he sees all these different things, the just and the unjust. And he looks around and he says, why are these wicked people, these evil people, doing so well in life? And it seems like, very often times, wicked people prosper. Raise your hand if you've thought the same exact thing at some point in your life. You know, raise your hand if you've had someone, you're a Christian obviously, so people come to you and ask you these questions. Raise your hand if you've had a Christian ask you this question before. Yeah, I've had it asked like, I can't tell you how many times, probably 50 to 100 times, literally. You know, this is a very common question. It's, it's a common obstacle for unbelievers even. That's oftentimes at, at my job place, at my workplace. I already had this subject picked out and I had somebody ask me this yesterday at 10 a.m., 9.30 a.m. while I was on a job site. One of a fellow worker. Just because people know that I'm a Christian, they'll want to talk to me about the Bible and stuff, so they'll bring up, and they know I'm a pastor specifically, so they'll bring up, oftentimes it's like, you know, about the blood moons, you know, you know the end time Bible prophecy. But sometimes I have a sincere question, and I've had people ask me this tons of times. Just yesterday, somebody asked me this question just in a different way, basically. People wonder this all the time. Unbelievers, when they look around at the world, they're like, why does it seem like wicked, evil? You know, there are people out there that will be promoted through deceit in their job. They'll lie 
And then it seems like they're being paid back for it sometimes, right? Like, man, that, like, that's their recompense, right? Like, that actually worked out for them. That was what got them this job. And you wonder, why is that happening? Why does this work this way, right? Haven't you ever wondered that? How is this person, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, advancing in life through deceit, through wickedness? How is it that their job is just pure, sinful, wicked garbage, but it's, but it's bringing all this prosperity. People that own casinos, people that are drug dealers sometimes will grow you know, to, 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 to uh, stages in this life where, where they're just extremely wealthy and they're successful and they're prospering. And what are they? They're happy, but they deal very treacherously. Jeremiah saw those same things. He looked around and he said, God, I know you're righteous. I know you're just. But answer this question for me, because it does it. Why is he saying, why does he start with that? Because he's saying this. It seems like these things conflict. It seems like there's something that's contradictory here that doesn't make sense. I know you're righteous. I know you're just. Then why does this happen? Explain to me. And there is an answer from the Bible. I'm going to go through this morning. I want to give you some points, some very clear points on why this happens. So when you're asked this question or when this thought pops into your mind, you can have a biblical answer to why do the wicked prosper? I want you to turn with me to Job chapter number 21. I want you to see that this question is asked by many people in the Bible numerous times. Job, the book of Job chapter number 21, almost phrased identically a few different times. Job chapter number 21 we're going to read, start reading in verse number 7. Job chapter number 21, verse number 7. The Bible says, <coughs> watch this, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, watch this, yea, are mighty in power. What's he asking? Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper, right? Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power. Verse 8, their seed is established in their sight with them, saying their children are established, they're set. They prosper as well. And their offspring before their eyes. Verse 9, their houses are safe from fear. So they live in what? They live in peace is what it's saying. Why are they living peaceful lives, he's wondering. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Verse 10, their bull gendereth and faileth not. Saying that uh, their possessions, if you're just modern day, right? Their possessions bring forth and are lucrative. Saying that they have these, they have whatever the bull that this may be referring to, a, a, you know, some sort of goat, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, herds of animals. And they, they're not dying all the time. It doesn't seem like their, their, their wealth is cursed. They bring forth and it's like, a, it seems almost like they're being blessed, right? It says the, their bull gendereth. That comes from like the word generation, gendereth, bring forth. And faileth not, their cow calveth, and casteth not her calf. Verse 11, they send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. What is it saying? They're happy. They're living in peace. They're prospering. Verse 12, they take the timbrel and harp, and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth. And in a moment, go down to the grave. So notice it even ends with they spend their days in wealth. If you were to look back, verse number one, or ver yeah, verse number one, it says, "Wherefore do the wicked live?" And it says, "Become old." So it's saying throughout. Sometimes it seems their whole life they live their days in wealth with happiness. Wherefore do the, does the way of the wicked prosper? You know, be, you see, even here in the book of Job, wondering the exact same thing. Why do wicked people do so well in life sometimes? I want you to look with me now here in the book of Job. Job chapter number 9, verse number 24. We'll see this discussed a few different times here. Job chapter number 9, verse number 24. It says, The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof, saying that the wicked basically sit in all places of judgment, all places of authority. They're the ones ruling. They're the ones that have power. They're prospering. They're successful. He, he covereth the faces of the judges thereof. And then it says, if not, where and who is he? Look at verse chapter 12, verse 6 now. Look with me at chapter number 12, Job chapter number 12, verse number 6. The Bible says, the tabernacle of robbers, the tabernacles, I'm sorry, plural, the tabernacles of robbers prosper. And they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. So notice it says the tabernacles of robbers. The tabernacles is the houses. It's specifically referring to tents, right? Saying the homes, the houses, if you will, the habitations of robbers, people that are thieves. They go and they steal things 
and said that they prosper. And it says, and they, prov and they that provoke God, they do wickedness, obviously by doing and performing, committing these sinful acts, they're going to be provoking God. It says, they that provoke God are secure. What does that mean? They're, they're, they're living a peaceful life. It's brought up over and over again. I want you to turn with me now to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. It's a book of wisdom. There's all different types of just profound things and profound thoughts in the book of Ecclesiastes. Likewise, the book of Proverbs written by Solomon. <clears throat> but often, you know, you'll read throughout the Bible the real deep things of life when you get to the book of Ecclesiastes. You'll notice a lot of the really deep questions, a lot of the really, you know, deep you know, philosophical subjects in life, they're discussed in the book of Ecclesiastes. Really deep things that people just wonder just about the purpose of life, why things are the way that they are, they're brought up in the book of Ecclesiastes. Look here at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, look at verse 15, it says this, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. Now watch this. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness. And then he says, And there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. So notice there he actually looks at both sides of the coin. He not only speaks of why does the wicked man prosper, he also says basically, you know, he, he talks about the question, if you will, if you were to form it as a question, why does the righteous man not prosper? Why does he die? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 8, just one chapter over. Ecclesiastes chapter number 8. <clears throat> Look at this in verse number 14. He says, there is a vanity which is done upon the earth. That there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. So basically discussing the same thing. He's saying, why is the wicked man receiving what you would think to be the reward that the righteous should be given? And then why on the other side is the righteous man being given the reward in which you would assume the wicked man should be given. He said, this is, this is vanity. That's why he started off in chapter 7, verse 15. He said, I've seen all things under the sun. You know, what is he saying? He's saying, you know, this is the extremity of the things I've seen. I've seen now I've seen everything, people will say, right? Now I've seen everything, right? So right here he's discussing how this, this seems to be something that conflicts, doesn't it? When you see the righteous man doing every, everything that he can and not prospering. But then you look and you see the wicked man, he's doing wickedness, he's committing sinful acts, and he is prospering. So people ask that question, and you'll hear people ask the question about uh, the good man, they'll say this, why do bad things seem like they always happen to, what, good people? People, that's such a common question, you, you have the question memorized. It's become cliche at this point, hasn't it? It's a very common question that people will wonder all the time. But you know, the Bible has the answer for these things. Uh, Proverbs, I'm going to read to you these next two. You go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter number 12. Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 32 says this, For the turning away of the simple, that would be the fool, for the turning away of the simple shall slay them. And then it says this, And the, prosperities of, the prosperity of the fools shall destroy them. So there, of course, the, uh, the simple and the fool are the same person. Notice it says the prosperity of fools. So this person is a, is a foolish man, and obviously it's referring to a sinful man if you read Read the, the entirety of Proverbs 1, and it says that he is prosperous. Malachi chapter number 3, verse number 15 says this, And now we call the proud happy. Saying these people, happy oftentimes is being likened unto being blessed. So it says, And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. And then it, say, it goes on to say this, Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. So it seems those that, lit, like it said, provoke God, Right? It says that they dwell securely. It seems to be that you look around and people that would tempt God, that they aren't punished by God. Right? Sometimes you look around and you're like, why isn't God punishing this man? Right? Why isn't he, why is he prospering? <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> these things seem to be illogical, don't they? They seem, if you just on the onset, why is this taking place? If there's a just God in heaven, why does it seem that injustice is happening every day before our lives? You know, uh, throughout the entirety of a man's life, he lives, he lives a wicked life, and it'll seem like he's never paid back for it. 
Well, the first point that I want to begin with is that they are not God's children. They are not God's children. I want you to look with me at Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 6. The Bible says this, <clears throat> For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So I want you to notice that there are no exceptions. And he does this to his sons, which is there also being, being likened unto those that he loves. And what happens? It says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Saying he punishes them. He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening... God dealeth with you as with sons. So if in your life you endure, you have to go through chastening or punishments from God because you have done wickedness or you have done something that is sinful, well, God's dealing with you as, as with a son. He is punishing you for the wicked deeds that you've done because you are his son. Look at verse number 8. But if ye be without chastisement... So it's saying that God is not punishing you, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Saying, whereof is referring back to chastisement. He's saying all are partakers of God's chastisement, if you are God's son. It says this then, then are ye bastards and not Son. So if you're not being punished, then you, that just proves that you are a bastard, saying you don't have a father and you are not God's son. Verse 9, furthermore, we have, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Verse 10, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, we read in Job chapter number 21 earlier, you may or may not have noticed this, but it says this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read again to you from Job chapter number 21, verse number 7 through 9. It says this, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Verse 9, their houses are safe from fear. Then it says this, Neither is the rod of God upon them. Now, Job here is, is asking the question, why do the wicked prosper? And why is the rod of God not upon them? Now, if we look at Hebrews chapter number 12, just starting off point number one, what does that tell us about the group that Job was speaking about? What does that tell us? That these people are what? Bastards and not sons. So if people look around today and they wonder why, why does it seem like these people are committing such wicked acts or wicked deeds and nothing happens? If you, this is, this is a general indicator of someone's salvation. Now it's not the proof of someone's salvation. That's to go way too far because you can never, you never know when the judgment is coming and you as a human being don't know the mind of God. You don't know when it's going to happen, how God's bringing it in their life. They may be punished behind the scenes and you don't know about it. So you can't use this to say, hey, I know that guy's not saved, right? But this can be a general indicator. If someone does, I'm just going to state this as a fact like this. If someone does live a very wicked, sinful, evil life and they're committing you know, wickedness after wickedness after wickedness, they're a man that comes to church or a woman that comes to church, they profess salvation, right? They, and, and they just keep doing all these wicked deeds, horribly wicked things behind the scenes and God never punishes them. According to Hebrews chapter number 12, you're not saved. You are actually not a child of God. Because it says, whereof all are partakers. So if, you are, if the rod of God is not upon you, then you are not a child of God. You are not a child of God. So what does that mean when it talks about that the wicked are prospering and the rod of God is not upon them? Well, it's because God is not dealing with them as with sons. They're not his children. See, I don't go around Walmart and see some kid you know, misbehaving and snag him up like, let me take care of this and start spanking him, right? Because he's not my son. He's not my responsibility. And why does God do that to his children? Because he loves them. He loves them as his children, right? Well, why is God not punishing the other ones, the, the wicked here? Why? Of course, because they're not his children. He's doing it so that for our own benefit, it tells you, right? He's doing it for us that we may be or might be partaker of his holiness, right? But, but why is he not punishing them? 
Because they're not his children. Because they are bastards and not sons, right? He, the reason why God punishes us in our lives, so this is important here. The reason why God punishes us as sons of God or children of God in our lives is because he loves us. Because he wants us to get things right. Why do you punish your children? Because you want them to do what's right. So you ask the question, why do wicked people do wicked things and still do well in life? Well, it's because they're not God's children and God's not trying to straighten them out. God's not trying to rehabilitate them or fix them. Let me say this too, and this is going to become more relevant later on in the sermon. Hell is not rehabilitation. Hell is not meant to try to fix your problems. It's too late, my friend. Hell is just pure punishment for what you deserve for what you've done on this earth. So if someone is being punished while they're on this earth, that proves that that man, by God, with the rod of God, that proves that they are a Christian. If someone is not and they're living a wicked, evil life and they just continue to do this wickedness and the rod of God is not upon them and they're just safe in their houses, they're prospering, everything they put their hand to, you know, it turns to gold, that person is not saved. They are not a child of God. The Bible says we're of all our partakers. It says, if not, then are ye bastards and not sons. That's an exclusive statement. That's very, very clear. <clears throat> I want you to turn with me now to... Uh, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I'm going to give you another point here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Why are they prospering in this world? Why are they prospering in the world? That's because this is their world. A lot of people don't understand this concept and it's very confusing to them because they think of that, you know, God being the Lord of all, right? He's, he's the God of all. But, but really, the Bible teaches, you have, to, you have to understand this in its spectrum, but the Bible teaches that this is their world, and this currently is not God's kingdom. God's, this is not God's kingdom when you look around. I want you to look with me here at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 3 says this, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Then verse 4, pay attention to this. In whom... The God of this world, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Do you notice what it said there in the beginning of verse number 4? It says, in whom the God of this world. God is not currently ruling over this world as the king. God is not currently ruling over this world. If you look around today, would you say that it looks like God's will is being done in the earth today? I mean, look at the laws that are being passed, the atrocities that are going on, what is, what is considered to be moral and immoral, everything that is allowed to take place. Would you, look, would you look around today and say, this is God's kingdom? Does this look like, is this what you would envision God's kingdom to be like when you think of God ruling as a king? If this, was, if this was, you know, in, in the sense of his world as in his kingdom, of course not, right? That's because this is the devil's kingdom. The devil is the god of this world. If you remember, if you think about this as well, when Satan came to Christ in Matthew 4 to tempt him, he tempted him a few different times, and one of the times he, he, he uh, tempted him with all the possessions of the world. He said, he shows him all the riches and honor, all the kingdoms of the world. All the kingdoms specifically is what it says. So think about that. All the kingdoms of the world. And then he tells Christ, he says, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt but fall down and worship me. What does that tell you? If, if he has the capability to be able to offer these things to Christ. And I've heard people say, well, he's just lying. That he's, he's lying to God about, what, about him. That's ridiculous. Like Christ doesn't know whether or not he's being lied to about something so silly like that. It's stupid. That's, it really doesn't even deserve an answer, right? You've heard that before. So he's, he stands there and he offers to Christ all the kingdoms of the world. It wouldn't be a temptation because Christ would know that, right? He says, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Do you know what that tells you? That he has all the kingdoms of the world in his hand. That he can give them or deliver them to anyone that he wants at any time. That they are in his possession and that he is the one that's ruling over them. Just like 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this world. The God of this world. So, doesn't it make perfect sense when we look around today and we see the wicked people, let's say the children of the devil, prospering, doesn't it make perfect sense that they would prosper, the children of the devil would prosper in the devil's kingdom? Wouldn't that make perfect sense? 
It, you know, many people don't understand the concept that this, that this world right now is under the reign of the devil. It's under the reign of Satan. God is not having his will right now you know, done throughout the world. You know, we in our lives should try to you know, have God's will done, right? But by and large, in the whole scheme of things, we look at planet Earth and the kingdoms of this Earth today, God is not ruling over this world. That's just a fact. God is not ruling over this world. I want you to turn with me now to uh, Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 3. That's why Jesus says when the soldiers come to arrest him, he says, daily you, you, you saw me teaching in the temple and you didn't lay any hands on me. But then he says this, he says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Right? This is this time. Talking about on earth. This is your time right now. When, when will it be Christ's time? When he comes back. When Christ comes back and he sets up his reign. You know, the Bible talks about when, when, ba when the whore of Babylon is reigning over all the earth. The central point is Jerusalem, of course. And you have the Antichrist seated. It says, and it, and it goes upon the whole world. It says that one of the plagues was darkness and that it was poured out upon the seat of Satan and upon his kingdom. When it goes throughout whole, all the world, you know why? Because it's his kingdom. This is his world. He rules and reigns in this world today. Look at uh, Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 3. We'll see this again spoken of. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 73, verse number 3. <clears throat> For I was envious at the foolish. Notice again, the foolish are the wicked. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So notice the foolish are the wicked, the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 4, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compass them, compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have, more than, they have more than heart could wish. They have more than they could even ask for, right? Verse 8, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. That's, that's uh, uh, you know, pride, prideful in a prideful manner or proudly, right? Like a loft is high up. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. So this is talking about them even cursing God. Verse 10, therefore his people return hither and waters of a, of a full cup are wrung out to them. It says, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? That's them asking like a rhetorical question again, trying to mock God. Like there is no knowledge in the, in the Most High. That's what they're saying. He doesn't even know what I'm doing, right? Look at verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly, and then it says this, who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. So here, we see David even thinking the same thing. David even thinking the same thing. Looking around and noticing that the wicked, the children of the devil, are prospering in this world, aren't they? But doesn't that make perfect sense, that, that statement, who prosper in the world, when you understand that the world, this world, is the world of Satan? A couple of things I want to point out to you is, if you look back up at verse number uh, uh, 5, look at verse number 5, they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. So they, they don't receive the rod of God. They're not punished for their wickedness. And then it says in verse number 6, Therefore pride compasseth them about, compasseth them about as a chain. Saying because they actually don't receive a punishment for the things that they do, they become proud. So you know what that tells you? This is a little nugget why God does punish you. What's the reason? To bring you down lowly. To make sure that you don't become, you know, uh, proud. You know, a person that, that does something that they should not do and gets away with it, what happens to them? We use a phrase normally. Normally people will say they've become emboldened, right? What does that mean? What does it mean to be bold? You, can, you know, obviously bold doesn't have to be proud, but a person that is, you know, uh, is proud is also bold, right? So they, they, they overlap. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're proud when you're bold, but that's what it means in that case. That person that is proud, they are emboldened because why? Because they got away with what they did. And if they continue to do this, what happens? They become more emboldened or more proud, proud and more prideful repeatedly. Now, in our lives, when God punishes us, when you try to commit some, some type of wicked, and you think, hey, I can get away with this. God will never punish me. And then just, you know, tragedy hits in your life. You know what that's going to do? 
It's going to humble you. Oftentimes when you see people that seem to be, even, even if you just think of this as confidence, right? If you, if you look at people that seem to be very confident people in their lives, and you look back, you, and maybe some sort of tragedy or some sort of devastation hit their lives, you'll notice it changes that person when you meet them. They act very different, don't they? They'll, they seem like a different person. Why? They're not proud anymore. They're not confident even anymore, right? They've been brought low to another state. God punishes us to keep us humble. That's one of the reasons why. He wants to repay us. He's righteous. He's just. He wants to make sure that he gives us that. But he's doing it for our benefit. And you know what? One of the things that works out when he punishes you is to humble you. Think about this. When the wicked continues to prosper and do all these things and are getting more wealth, they're becoming more proud, aren't they? This is getting more what? It's getting more dangerous, isn't it? It's getting more and more dangerous. They're, 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 what are they doing? They're heading down a path that's just like, it's becoming worse and worse. Does God stop them? He doesn't. He's not worried about them, is he? He just lets them continue on. So that should, you know, when we think about that in our lives, that you should be grateful for that, that God loves you so much that says, hey, I don't want this to happen to you. But then he looks at them and he's like, you're not my children. Just continue doing what you're doing. Why? Why does he do that to us? Because he wants us to keep, he wants us to stay humble. Look at the, the following verse. It says, <clears throat> their eyes stand out with fatness. He says, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. This is one thing that we're going to see over and over again, is that oftentimes when this question is asked, it's asked in the context of why does the wicked do bad things to the righteous, even, and the wicked is not repaid for it, right? Why are the wicked able to, to oppress or to persecute righteous people, and it seems like they're not punished for it? Really, if you would have paid close attention to the context, often almost in, exclusively in all the passages that we read, that was the context every single time. He goes on to say there in verse number 9, it says, They set their mouth against the heavens, so they're cursing or even blaspheming God. And their tongue walketh through the earth. Saying they're loud and proud, right? They just go through the, wor the, the earth and the world and just running their mouth. Nothing happens to them. Therefore, his people return hither. So notice how the people are getting away from them. They return hither. It's saying that, they, that they're fleeing. It says, and water of a full cup are wrung out to them. Verse 11, and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly. What does he mean by that? Saying this is the way that the ungodly live. This is what happens to the ungodly. This is the summary of the ungodly. It says, who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. I want you to turn with me now to uh, Proverbs chapter number 23, verse number 17. I want to focus on the very first statement that David made. He said this in Psalm 73, 3, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What, is that, what is he saying? He's saying he was envious of the prosperity of the wicked, right? We're actually given commandments. We're given uh, admonitions to not be envious of the sinner, not be envious of the wicked. Why are you given those admonitions? Not to be envious of the wicked or not to be envious of the foolish. Because they have something to, to envy of. Why? The prosperity of the wicked. In this world, the, the wicked often prosper. This is their kingdom. And they are able to get away with it in this world because God is not dealing with them as with sons. God knows that, of course, so God tells us don't be envious of them. And there are reasons not to be envious of them. We should be happy. Hey, I'm happy that I'm not prospering in the way that they prosper because I'm a child of God. Because I'm saved. Because I'm of God's kingdom, right? So that's what David discusses here. He talks about how he, he's envious of the wicked. And this can sometimes be the human tendency. Uh, you know, due to our sinful nature, you can sometimes look at the wicked and say, hey man, they're able to do just whatever they want, fulfill whatever lust that they want, and they get away with it. You know, this can be the sinful nature within us, right? And you're like, why are they able to do all these things, right? You know, and then I do it and I get punished. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, people will think that, right? They'll, they'll wonder. You know, they'll look at this and wonder and then it, it can sometimes call, even David struggled with it, Right? He said that he was envious. He even admits it in his heart. He was envious at the prosperity of the wicked, right? Well, we're told, look at Proverbs chapter number, uh, 23, verse number 17. It says this, Let not thine heart envy sinners. Then he says this, 
but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. So if you think about that, it says, not, let not your heart envy sinners, because they're, of course, prosperous. The, the wicked prosper. Don't envy them, right? And then he says this, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Why should you be in the fear of the Lord when he's talking to the Christian? Because you're going to be punished. Because you're going to be disciplined by God. But continue to fear God, right? Because we have something to fear, right? Look at uh, Proverbs 24, 19. Proverbs 24, 19. You'll notice again, uh, as I was pointing out, oftentimes this is in the context of the unjust persecuting the just. Proverbs 24, 19, it says, Fret not thyself because of evil men. What does it mean to fret? It's like worrying, being, being anxious, right? He says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. <clears throat> I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter number 5, verse number 28. So he tells you again, don't be envious of the wicked. Don't envy the wicked. Why? Because the wicked prosper. Very often do the wicked prosper. Not always, but it's very common that the wicked prosper. If you look at all of the most prosperous men, if you took a, you know, the list of probably the top you know, you know, thousands even of, of prosperous men and women in this world today, the most successful by the world's means, by what we're speaking of now, wealth, things like that, by and large, probably every one of them aren't saved. That just proves in general the wicked prosper, don't they? And they will, and a lot of them got where they are by doing wickedly. Somewhere along the lines, or they're 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 practicing something that's that's sinful. You know, they're they're you know, look at Donald Trump. Look at, you know, he's the president of the United States. You know, I don't think anyone in here is gonna argue with me that he's a prosperous man, right? You're not gonna try to argue that, right? He's an extremely prosperous man. Is he a wicked man? Extremely wicked man. How did he get that way? Look at his business practices. Not only the businesses that he ran are wicked, but when you get up to the top like that, it's because your business practices oftentimes are wicked. And they just can, they're able to continue down this road and it seems as if that because of their wickedness, they're prospering, right? Because why? The rod of God is not upon them. They're able to just continue living their life, it seems, right? You're in Jeremiah 5.28, you'll see this again, the context showing that they are, at this time, oppressing the righteous by their wicked deeds. It says, they are waxen fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. It says, they judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. So these are wicked people that are not punishing other wicked people, and they're wickedly judging and they're still prospering, even though they're, you know, in this case, doing wickedly. And then it says this, and the right of the needy do they, do they not judge. So what are they not doing? They're not helping the righteous, the people that need help, right? They're not judging for the right person. They're judging for the wrong person. They're committing wickedness in judgment. Psalm chapter number 94, verse number 3, you'll notice this again. It says, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? What is David saying here? How long is this going to take place? It seems like they're never punished. And what does he mean triumph? Who are they triumphing over? They're victorious over who? The righteous. It seems as if they just oppress and persecute the righteous and they just continue to get away with it. Go to Revelation chapter number 6. This will continue until Christ comes back. Go to Revelation chapter number 6. What, it, you know, we even see the very beginning, what do we see, the, the, uh, of, of time, the unrighteous persecuting the righteous. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 6, look at verse number 9, the, getting towards the uh, final time of the tribulation, it says in verse number 9, the fifth seal, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altars the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So what are they wondering even while in heaven? You know, the, the, the implication is like how much more time is going to go on? How much longer until they're going to be punished for what they have done 
to the righteous. They just continue to do wickedly, and it seems like they just continue to prosper. When are you going to put an end to this? Right? When are you going to put an end to this? And then he tells them, in verse number 11, And white robes were given unto, unto them, unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So notice that it's not their time yet to be punished, is it? It's not yet their time. He says, be patient, and then he says that they need, he's telling them that they need to wait that they need to wait. Psalm chapter number 37 verse number 7 says this, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked, wicked devices to pass. What is he saying? He's saying, rest in the Lord and wait. For what? And then he goes on to say, Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in His way. What's the person doing? They're getting worried and getting anxious and they're, they're getting bothered. Because why? Because this person's bothering them and they're not being punished. But what's the advice? Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. What's it saying? Their time will come. Their time will come. I want you to turn with me now to Luke chapter number 16. That's the third point. Their time will come. See, right now it's their kingdom. Right now it's their world. And of course they're going to prosper in their world because the God of gods is allowing the devil to rule in this kingdom and to have his way. He stepped back and of course... Satan, he gives us free will. Satan steps in and he's able to manipulate everyone, isn't he? And this is his world and this is his kingdom. And God, only the true God, only punishes those that are his children. So, of course, in their kingdom, when they're not being punished by the Most High, the devil's just going to keep blessing them from him, right? He's going to keep allowing them to prosper. He's going to keep allowing them, you know, to grow and to be successful and to, and to gain more wealth and to gain more power, right? But their time will come. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 8 verse number 11 says this, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So because the wicked are not punished right away, they'll just keep doing wickedness, right? They grow, pride compasses them about. They'll just be con to continue to become more wicked and they'll just grow in prosperity. If someone were to ask me this question from now, I, I've thought about this more and more just lately, and when someone asks me about this subject, the best place to turn them to is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. That is, when someone wants to talk about why do the wicked prosper, and why do the, the righteous or those that are God's children, why do they not do well in life? The t what, what it really comes down to is... The concept of how small and how little bit of time we spend in this life and then how large and vast eternity is compared unto that. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16, look at verse number 19, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It says this, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and it says, and fared sumptuously every day. What's it say? He fared, he fared some just saying, he's a wicked man, we'll see this in a moment, and he was prosperous. He prospered as a wicked man. Look at verse 20. <clears throat> and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores. Is this man prospering? Of course not. He's laying at his gate. He doesn't have a home. This is just where he, you know, he has nowhere, no home even to go to. This is where he spends his time. He's, a, he's, a, he's homeless, right? It says, verse 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So he's living a miserable life. He's got these dogs. I mean, I always picture this guy laying, laying down at the gate and the rich man walking by and casting him food. And the dogs are eating the food. And when the dogs come over and eat the food, they're like licking at him. And he's trying to get the food, get the food from the dogs. And he's eating the food. I mean, he's living a miserable life. Miserable. You have to try to picture these things in your mind. He's, he's filled with disease, it sounds like. Sounds like. He's, he's, he's as poor as can possibly be. He's starving, literally. It says this in verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And then it says this in verse 23, And in hell 
he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Verse number 25 is the most profound verse on this subject in the entire Bible. Look at what it says. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Then he says this, But now, notice, now... He is comforted, but thou art tormented. Keep reading verse number 26. And beside all this between us and you, watch this, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. This is important. Lest they also come into this place of torment. I want you to notice what his focus is on now. What he cares about. What? He cares. He's thinking about his brethren. He's thinking about his brethren. Just All I want to do is I, just want, I want them not to be able to come here. What's he fixated on? How bad this is. I want you to think about that. Is he, is he reflecting on, man, I lived a good life. Man, look at, look at how prosperous I was. Right? Yeah, I know I'm in hell and burning in torments, but man, I lived a good life. That matters at all. That doesn't matter to him at all at this point. All he can think about is how bad this is. And then, all, and then eventually he thinks, man, I don't want anyone else to come here, especially my brethren. Right? He says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, but Lazarus evil things. And he says, But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And he's standing there, and all he's doing is just begging for just a drop of water. Do you know how long that's going to go on for? This is about a real person. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, this is not a, a parable. Abraham is a real person. It gives you the name of this guy. You know, uh, uh, real people are not mentioned in parables. That's foolish. There's a real rich man that we're not told his name that is still in hell right now and he desires a drop of water right now just as much as he did before. Thou thousands of years he's been in hell. Do you know how long he lived on this earth? Well, not exactly, but I can, I can, I can guarantee you it was less than 150 years just to make sure. So he had 150 years of prosperity. You know how long he's had torment? Now, I don't know when this took place. It took place after Abraham. You don't know that this took place at the time of Christ. It's assumed. I've heard many times, it's been 2,000 years and he's still burning. It might have been 3,000 years, friend. It could have been, this could have taken, it just, we know that it took place after Abraham. You don't know when. It, it's assumed, probably closer to the time of Christ. But you don't know exactly when this happened. This is the point. He lived probably 80 years on this earth in prosperity as a wicked man. But now he's been burning for thousands of years in hell. Is it really worth it? Who really came out on top? Wouldn't you, if you could switch with either one of these people, wouldn't you rather lay at that gate with sores and allow dogs come and lick all over you? I'd eat, I'd eat that rich man's food all day. If I could, had to choose which life that I wanted to, to pick, if, 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 if I had to come back, obviously we don't believe in reincarnation, and I, and I had to choose hypothetically of, of one of these two lives, I'd go with Lazarus. Hands down, it's a silly question. And so would the rich man. Think about that. This is a perfect example of that. And, and, and Abraham explains to him, Son, remember that thou in li thy lifetime receiveth, good, receiveth thou good things. He's like, but Lazarus, evil things. He's like, you were a wicked man and you prospered. Right? Lazarus didn't. Who was a child of God. And you never know, he might have had some, some sinful addiction or something and that was God chastening him was why he was the way he was. That's possible. 
doesn't have to be because the prosperity gospel is foolish in the first place. And that ties in with all of this as well. You know, all of this ties in with this because people think, oh, if you're prospering, then, then you must be, you know, a child of God. It doesn't work like that. The, the most prosperous people in this life are the wicked. This is the devil's kingdom. When you look at the, these two situations, you see the wicked prospering, and you see what? The righteous man not doing well in life. Do you know the best answer to a person? Why do the wicked prosper? Their time has not yet come. Like he tells the, the souls under the altar, just wait. Just wait. Like he tells them, hey, fret not yourselves, but wait on the Lord. Right? You know, the reason why they're able to continue in this prosperity is only because they're not a child of God. It's only because they're not a child of God. <clears throat> Psalm 92, 7 says this, When the wicked spring as the grass, saying they're flourishing, they're prospering, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, he says this, It is that they shall be destroyed forever. Think about that. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. Jo Job 25 <laughs> says this, That the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite for a moment. They're triumphing on this earth. It, it's not even, you can't even measure it. It's, you can't even say it's like a drop in, in a buck of water, a drop in a bucket of water. You can't even say that it is like as a sand, on, a piece of sand, one, you know, a grain of sand on a seashore. You cannot measure 80 years against eternity. They cannot even be compared with one another. It's like comparing apples with oranges. You know why? Because you have those 80 years here, which is a fixed number. This is an unfixed number that continues on for all eternity. They cannot be compared. Those 80 years, it, it, living it as a wicked man and, and prospering, mean nothing. Amen. Mean nothing. Go ask the rich man what he thought about it. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.25 says this, Choosing rather to su suffer affliction with the people of God, speaking of Moses, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So we read earlier Psalm chapter 73. I'm going to read it in, in its entirety to you. It says this, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He's wondering why bad things happen to me. And he's good to Israel. Verse 3, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Bad things are happening to him, but it, the wicked are prospering. And he looks at them and he's envious. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not, they are not troubled as other men. He's saying like him, right? He says this, They're not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know, and is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm living a righteous life, it seems like, for no reason. He says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued. Watch this. Watch the word that's used. And chastened every morning. I wonder why. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I shall offend against the generation of thy children. Watch verse number 16 and 17. Pay close attention. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. What's he talking about? The age-old question. Why do the wicked prosper? And why do bad things seem to happen to good people? If you say, why do, does it seem like that bad things happen to saved people? Well, they're punished for their sinful deeds. But why do the wicked, why do they prosper? Because they're not a child of God, number one. Because God's not punishing them in this life. This is the devil's kingdom. This is their kingdom. Of course they're going to prosper in this. And thirdly, their time has not yet come. It says this, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for, for me. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, listen carefully, 
Then understood I their end. Then understood I their end. Do you know what it all comes down to? Eternity. That's what it comes down to. Do you know what really matters? Ask the rich man. Eternity. So when you look at the wicked and you think, man, why are they prospering? Why are they able to do good? Why are they able to do well and it seems like they're thriving in all these things? Just be happy that God, that you're a child of God and that you're being punished by God. Because ultimately, you're going to be carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Amen. And those wicked men that maybe afflict you and do badly and maybe beat you maybe in a promotion at your job or maybe things happen in our lifetime to where we are the souls under the altar. We say, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And there'll be a robe that's given to us. You know what they're going to say? Their time has not yet come. Their time has not yet come. And they will be as the rich man in hell. They may have lived their lives on this earth for 80, 70, 90 years even if they live a long life in prosperity. That is not to be compared unto eternity. Not even to be compared unto eternity. You know, you think, man, how is God just? How is God just? How can God be just when He allows things like this to happen? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. That means that God's not settling accounts right now. Because the true reward, even to both the just and the unjust, is not given right now. We haven't stood before the judge yet. That's when things will be, you know, made right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for answering these tough, hard questions that philosophers like Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, these fools could never figure out. Their life depended on it. But we can just go to the Bible.